turn your Bibles, or a few Bibles, to the Old Testament book of Jeremiah, chapter 31, starting at verse 3. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, though I was their husband to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no more shall every man teach his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and their sin I will remember no more. Time Magazine recently had a special issue entitled, Ten Ideas That Are Changing Your Life. These, they dealt with things like technological and sociological and environmental changes in the world and in our society. Number four on the list was about religion. Personally, I don't think that the topic they chose was particularly new. I've been reading about this for years. It is a, a variation on the spiritual but not religious theme that religious professionals have been talking about for the last 20 years or so. What seems to be new, according to Time Magazine, is that the trend is accelerating, it's continuing, and, that it, and it is growing. The article notes that the fastest growing religious group in America is those who say they have no religious affiliation. In this particular article, calls them the nuns, now, not the Roman Catholics, it's just you know, the NUN, but the N-O-N-E. When asked in surveys what their re religious affiliation is, they answer none. Now the nuns have doubled since 1990. They now make up 16% of the population. And these people are not the atheists, but they are out of another category, or agnostics, they make up 4%. The nuns believe in God and pray, and many will even participate in spiritual practices, but they are not involved in traditional religious organizations or institutions. The emergent church movement of uh, the last few years is one aspect of this phenomenon. It's been written up, up about a lot. It is reinventing Christian spiritual community and practice. It is the next new thing in religion. In my mind, this is not really new. It's Prophet Jeremiah was talking about something very much like this 2,500 years ago. Jeremiah prophesied about the next new thing in the religion of his day, and he called it the New Covenant. And I think it is at the heart of Christian spirituality. It's what causes periodic reformations in the Christian church. There's a phrase in the 17th century, um, called Ecclesia Reformata Semper Reformanda, which means the church reformed and always being reformed. It's one of the watchwords of the Protestant Reformation, and it was understood that the Reformation of the 16th century was not a one-time event, but that the church needed to continually be renewed and reformed. This was not understood as the church reforming itself, it was understood that God would undertake this reformation in each generation. Now, Christianity easily follows, falls into legalism and dogma. It continually needs to be revitalized. And this is what Jeremiah was talking about concerning the Hebrew religion of his day over 500 years before there was a Christian church. It's what I would like to talk about this morning, using Jeremiah's words as a format. Jeremiah talks about a new covenant that was different from the old covenant. He says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel, with the house of Judah, 
not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers, in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke. So I was a husband to them, says the Lord. Now Christians understand this prophecy to refer to the new covenant established by Jesus. Jesus actually used Jeremiah's phrase at the Last Supper. He said, this is my blood of the new covenant, the letter to the Hebrews. Charles Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant. This new covenant needs to be a continually renewed covenant. Otherwise, it just sinks back into the old legalism and dogmatism. <clears throat> Jeremiah describes four aspects of this new thing, this, this new covenant. The first is inner guidance. Jeremiah says in verse 33, that this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. So Jeremiah is talking about the difference between our religion and inner religion. The old covenant was about following external rules. It was law. Now, laws are not bad. We are a nation of laws. Our country has countless laws and ordinances at the federal and the state and the local level. Yesterday morning, I had a, uh, a technician come by to fix our TV satellite. It was out of, out of alignment, I guess, or something, due to the frost, you know, the, the ground thawing out. And uh, so he came to, to fix it. And one of the first things he did, as he said after he arrived, he asked me if there was a law in Sandwich that all houses had to be white. <laughs> I said, no, but it's pretty close. You know. <laughs> Congress uh, seems to love passing laws, more and more laws. And the judicial branch of government interprets these laws, and the law enforcement enforces these laws. It seems like we are a nation in love with laws. If we think that something is wrong with the world, we pass a law. We think that we've really done something when we've, when we've passed a law. We, we think that every problem can be solved by a new law or by a new regulation. It's no wonder that there's a, there's a whole movement in our country against, uh, against that type of thinking and trying to get government. You know, uh, to back off a bit. Religion tends to follow the same type of pattern. We think that spiritual, moral problems in life can be solved by following some laws, some moral laws, or some religious rules. Jeremiah is saying that when it comes to spiritual matter, there's a the need for something different, something new. I will put my law in their minds, God says, and write it on their hearts. Jeremiah is saying that true religion and morality is from the inside out rather than from the outside in. It is internal and not external. Now, this does not mean there's no right or wrong, or that everyone decides for themselves what is correct. The Bible describes a period of lawlessness in the Old Testament, known as the time of the judges, as a time, and I quote, when everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Now, Jeremiah is not advocating that. It's not advocating anarchy or moral relativism. He's saying that God has a will. He's saying that he guides us from the inside of the human being, and his will is not imposed from the outside. When it comes to practical application of this in our lives, it means that we do not surrender our moral responsibility to external religious authority. That we are not children who need to be told what to do by religious institutions. That we don't follow a religious rule book, we follow God's law written on our hearts and minds. It means that we trust God living within us as Holy Spirit more than religious authorities that tell us what God wants of us. The second point that Jared makes is in the rest of verse 33. He says, I will be their God, and they shall be my people. My first point was about inner guidance. The second point is about intimate relationship. True religion is about a real relationship with God. Now, evangelicalism talks a good game when it comes to this point. But I don't think it's always practiced when it's preached. My experience, being a pastor of churches, both mainline Protestant churches and evangelical churches, 
is that many people who talk the most about the importance of a personal relationship with God don't really have much more of a relationship than those who don't talk about it very much. Those are the more traditional uh, Protestants, if you will. A lot of people don't have, it seems to me, what one would call a close relationship with God. Now, I'm just, you know, that's what I, I sense. Now, I don't know this for sure. I can't, you know, see into anyone's heart. Only God knows. But I know what people have confided in me in private moments over 38 years that I've been in ministry. And many people have a belief in God. They believe there is a God and that God has created this universe sometime in the past, but they don't really feel very connected to God, don't really feel very close to God. They don't really have a sense that God is involved directly in their lives. Other people talk about having real spiritual experiences and strong emotions connected to religion and are very faithful to religious tradition, but also don't seem to uh, have a relationship. Jeremiah is describing something new here, something more. He's describing an intimate relationship. Of course, you know, atheists will, don't think that I have a relationship with God either. They would describe God as my imaginary friend, as one person <laughs> voiced it to me. Like uh, children growing up have an imaginary friend, they think that Christians simply have, have outgrown our childhood imaginary friend. They don't think God is real. They think I'm just making God up, believing a figment of my own imagination. That God just seems real to me. That I have made God in my own image. Now, maybe they're right. I mean, I have, but I have never had, I have never had an imaginary friend as a child. So I really wouldn't know what that was like. I didn't believe in God as a teenager. I never had a relationship with God until I was in my early 20s. And this connection that I had with God certainly feels real to me. And I believe I have a real relationship with God, and I don't think that's a, it's unusual. I believe that anyone can have such a relationship. This leads me to my next point. Third Jeremiah says in his new covenant that there is an intuitive knowledge. We talked about the inner guidance and the intimate relationship. This third point is intuitive knowledge. He says in verse 34, No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. Now, how do you develop an intimate relationship with God? In my experience, it's more intuitive than objective knowledge. Now, there are things that we can know physically from our five senses. There are things that we can know mentally through deduction and reasoning. For me, God is not like that. You know, I do not know God through my senses because God's not physical. I do not even know God through my reasoning even though I believe it is reasonable to believe in God. I don't think you can logically prove the existence of God. I know God through my spirit, just, which is just as real to me as my mind or my body. I know God through intuition. I know God's will through conscience. I commune with God in my heart. The way we have a real relationship to God is to cultivate this spiritual dimension of our lives. And there's no set formula, no set three or four steps or points that you can, you can do this anymore there is in any relationship that you have. You have to find your own way, develop your own relationship with God, just like with any other human relationship. But if we desire to have an intimate relationship with God, we must devote time to that relationship. We have to spend time thinking about God. We have to spend time with God. Here I'm not talking just about you know, formal prayer or printed devotions that you read each day. Now those are good, and I do those, but if the only time that you 
you spoke with your spouse or with your friends is when you read something to them, you know, or read something about them that would not be much of a relationship. You know, I'm talking about cultivating a continual awareness of God. I'm talking about living in the presence of God, living in God as we live in this world, breathing God like we breathe the air, swimming in God like a fish swims in the ocean. If you ask a fish what water was, they could not tell you because they live in the water in the same way we live in God. Paul says, in him we live and move and have our being. The key to a relationship with God is to direct our attention to our intuitive awareness of the presence of God. God is here now. It's not just a doctrine to believe with our heads called the, the <coughs> omnipresence of God. It is an experienced reality. And all we have to do is use our intuitive knowledge to notice that reality. We can do it right now. Simply sense the presence of God right here in our midst today. As we saw we sang at the very beginning, surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. It is obvious. In fact, it's so obvious, I think, that we often miss it. We take it for granted, just like the light that we see by. Developing a relationship with God is taking the time to pay attention to the God that you sense is here and foster a conscious awareness of God's presence throughout the day. I want to move on to the fourth point that Jeremiah makes in this passage. It is total forgiveness. The last line of our passage says, For I will forgive their iniquity, and their sin I will remember no more. Now forgiveness has historically been the main focus of Christianity. Now there is a lot more to Christianity than forgiveness of sins, but forgiveness is at the heart. And that's what uh, many people don't like about Christianity. That there is too much talk about sin and forgiveness. But this is an important dimension of our human condition that needs to be addressed. And that's exactly what the Gospel does. It takes the reality of sin seriously and deals with it directly. It doesn't explain sin away psychologically or sociologically. It doesn't downplay it or minimalize it. It acknowledges that guilt is real in our lives, in our minds and hearts. It needs to be addressed. And the Christian gospel frees us from this power of sin and the power of guilt. A lot of people, you know, they don't really know Christianity very much, think Christianity is all about making you feel guilty. But it's really just the opposite. It gets us to acknowledge the reality of guilt and eliminates it so it does not control us. It is a powerful spiritual, emotional freedom. We can be free from the bondage of things that we have done wrong. And the things that people have done wrong to us. That we can experience complete forgiveness and have the power in the Holy Spirit to completely forgive people who have wronged us. This is the power of the Gospel. Now, if you don't sin and you've never been sinned against, then you don't need this gospel. But if you have ever wronged a person, or if a person has ever wronged you, then you need the gospel. Now, we can go through all the counseling and the psychotherapy that we want to, and I'm a believer in counseling. It does a lot of good in helping people deal with, uh, with psychological harm and problems in their lives, but we also need a spiritual solution to the spiritual problem of sin and guilt. That's what the Gospel does. And it does it through the cross of Jesus. Now I can't explain this very well, how the cross does this. The theology of the cross, as soon as I get into that and try to start explaining it, it becomes very complicated, theoretical, and philosophical, very quickly. And I don't think what we need is a new theology or a new philosophy. What we need is the inner assurance that our sins are completely dealt with and forgotten by God. As it says, for I will forgive their iniquity and their sins, I will remember no more. We need the power to be able to forgive people for the things that they did that we can't seem to forget. 
That is what the cross provides. Somehow by the power of God, Jesus dealt decisively with sin by dying on the cross and by rising from the grave. That's what the gospel says. And this forgiveness can be appropriated into our lives and experienced through faith in Christ. That is the bottom line. We can spend a lifetime trying to understand this, but it only takes a moment to accept it and to, under, and to experience it. This is the new covenant that Jeremiah prophesied. And that is the new covenant established by Jesus Christ. Let's bow our heads. Lord God, we confess that we deal with, with wrong in the world. Wrong happens all the time. We hear about it, we see it, we experience it, we have done it. And we want to not just kind of brush underneath the rug, we just forget and hope that time will heal all wounds and just kind of go away. Lord, we know that it needs to be dealt with. And we are so grateful that you have dealt with it. That you have given us complete forgiveness of sins of everything that we have done. And it almost as important as that, as important as that, you have allowed, given us the power of the Holy Spirit to be able to forgive, to be the vehicle of your grace and love to forgive those who have wronged us and wronged those that we love. What a precious gift you have given to us. We thank you for this. In Christ's name.